thing and ignoring trip. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music. Jason, Joe, and Crams are here. And after a bunch of weeks covering, what have we been doing? We did 72. That was a lot of fun. But before that, we were hitting a lot of these like British uh, alternative and indie rock bands. Uh, but we are, we are getting uh, back to some hard rock this week. We haven't done a hard rock band in a while. And uh, we are going to uh, tackle the discography of Def Leppard this week. They've got 12 studio albums for us to rank. Uh, if you're new to the channel, we rank a different band's discography every week. We also give you our top 10 songs for the same band during that week and have a third discussion video as well. If that sounds cool to you, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. Uh, Def Leppard, how much did you guys know before the week? Well, when I was growing up, we had Pyromania and Hysteria on vinyl. And then through that stupid ass Maxwell Hell CD giveaway thing, we had the vault. Like when I had like their greatest hits thing, the one with the green album cover. Had that. Listened the shit out of that. My mom is like a huge Def Leppard fan. And, you know, Garth used to name drop them a lot in Wayne's World. So I was hella into them when I was like 10 years old. It was all hair metal when I was that age. I like if you didn't have killer guitar riffs and hair metal when I was like ten, I just wasn't interested. So it was all Van Halen, Motley Crue, Def Leppard. I was a pretty cool fifth grader. Yeah, uh, way cooler back then, obviously. Yeah, Joe, I was cooler back then. Yeah, you were. Uh, I don't know that much Def, surprisingly. Just the Robert John Mutt Lang records, and that was about it coming into this week. But I do love the 80s work. Their 80s work is great, but uh, I don't know the rest of it. Um, so, yeah, I knew the Mutt Lang records, the, the three the three big ones. Uh, I don't think I ever listened to much beyond that. I knew that some of those 90s records had terrible reviews. Uh, so... I knew some of those weren't very highly thought of, so I kind of skipped those. I did. My dad had the uh, the covers album, yeah, on CD. So I was familiar with that. I, I did listen to that a decent bit back in 2006 or whenever that was. Uh, but other than that, uh, yeah, just like those four records is all I knew heading into the week. It's yeah with an exclamation point. So you got to, <laughs> yeah, like Joe just did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was pathetic, dude. All right, let's get into it. Number 12, who's starting off? Can I go first? I haven't gone first in a while. You want to go first? Do whatever you want. All right. Last place for me, number 12, is X. Man, I thought slang was going to be the bottom after listening to that, but then they go full-on adult contemporary here, clearly trying to follow the Bon Jovi model, and it just does not work for Def Leppard at all. Some of the tracks here actually like legit sound like the Backstreet Boys. Uh, there is a song here written by Max Martin. There's a Wayne Hector song, and that's someone who has written for Nicki Minaj and One Direction and The Wanted. There is most of the record they did write themselves, actually. Uh, and most of those tracks kind of sound like later day Aerosmith, minus any kind of swagger or Steven Tyler charisma. You know, Steven Tyler can sell some of those clunky lyrics sometimes, and Joe Elliott just doesn't make anything convincing at all. It's just all all pretty lame, uh, pretty boring. Torn to Shreds sounds like an Evan and Jaren song or something. It's very like minivan rock, uh, turn of the millennium, the calling, Lifehouse. That's the kind of vibe I'm getting from this. It doesn't rock very hard at all. I think this is maybe one of the worst records I've listened to for the channel. It's not like totally inexplicable the way the Boston record is and the Blondie record, but it's really, really bad. It's just total crap. Half a star for X. Holy shit, that is a low score. <laughs> all right, well, I'll go second. First of all, I don't want anyone ripping on my sweater in the comments section again here. This was given to me as a gift and I love it. Second of all, yeah, X is my last it's 1.5. I'm not nearly as harsh. 0.5? Damn. But yeah, it's adult contemporary, just modern pop rock sheen bullshit. All forms of the metal are gone. It's unbelievably, unbelievably bad. Uh, I've got The Calling and Sixpence None the Richer kind of noted as uh, their contemporaries for this album. Uh, 
the hooks are really drab. There's nothing to grow onto. I'd say there's maybe a moment or two. And by moment, I mean like a bar or stanza and you're so beautiful. That's decent. Every day is God is awful. Like they're not singing about Jesus Christ, but the lameness of the spirit might as well just be Christian rock. And some of the lyrics are just so adult contemporary bad that like Hallmark wouldn't hire some of these fucking people to write their greeting cards, but they're just so bad. It's elementary level songwriting. It's just like, that. Oh God, it's terrible. And they're not even like getting into like the big riffs or anything. It's just a four chord songs played without any ump. Like there's no snarl to the guitar. I don't even know if the drums are really crashing unless they're signifying that the chorus is coming. It's just so fucking shitty. But I'm not going that low. 1.5. I have a 1.5 star album as well, but it's not X. Uh, I think that's giving the band a little too much credit because they did bring in outside songwriters. And I think at this point in their career, those outside songwriters are a lot better than what Def Leppard is regurgitating out. I have Def Leppard, the self-titled at the bottom. I guess they were trying, you know, when you do like a self-titled album, 15, 20 years into your career, 30 years, whatever it is, it means like you're you're starting over. Like this is a return to form, back to basics. And this is sort of that because you get some of those sounds and the guitars are a little harder and a little more edge to them. But this the songs are just terrible. The lyrics are just god awful. Um, let's go. Like you think you're going to get something maybe a little harder edged, a little more rocking, but it just every song on here falls apart. All of those big choruses, like there's none of that. There's none of those giant like sing-along choruses. And it, it just sounds like Def Leppard, like neutered without any like personality at all. Um, even a song like Sea of Love, which like it feels like it's going to build into like a, a big fist pumping chorus and just like pulls back into this. I don't know. It's like a Tears for Fears song chorus or something. It's just... Like it builds and then just completely pulls the rug from out uh, from under you into this really lame chorus. Uh, Man Enough, just some of the worst lyrics I've heard. We Belong sounds like, you know, Bon Jovi. And I get a lot of Bon Jovi on this. 1.5 stars for the self-titled. We're starting in the gutter. Yes, we are. And I'm still not going to be to a, a star and a half. I've got slang at number 11. This is their attempt at like a darker alt rock record in the mid nineties. It's really bad. It's not believable at all. They've got these glitchy electro beats, drum loops, middle Eastern elements, bad rap rock. It is just, and I, how would you even make a set list with these songs? Like, can you imagine going from something on this record into photograph? It would make no sense whatsoever. Adrenalize felt a little out of place in 92, but it was like, Definitely better that they were sticking to their guns and ignoring trends and just like kind of doing their thing. I don't know what this is supposed to be at all. Breathe the Sigh is really bad. Sounds like All for One or some kind of like R&B vocal group. Uh, the deep vocals on Deliver Me sound like the Eddie Van Halen vocals on Van Halen 3 on that one track that he sings. They're just terrible sounding. I hate the production. Everything seems forced. There aren't any good songs. It's not like if it had different production that this would be a better record. The songs are terrible. This album completely sucks. It's a total embarrassment. One star. Wow. They're not that bad, Jason. Come on. They're a little worse than the best Three Dog Night albums. Let's just put it that way. But I'm with you. Can we go the distance? Number 11 for me is slang, but I've got it at two stars. I merely think it's bad. I don't think it's terrible. Um, but they do kind of abandon everything and go for a weird, overproduced, heavier, and kind of almost industrial type of sound. It's supposed to be really edgy. And you can just picture like those wannabe faux extreme kind of graphics coming in, like if they were to make music videos for these songs. But it doesn't work at all. Joe Elliott is coming up with some really awkward vocal melodies at times. That muted scream and truth is really bad. But yeah, kind of what Jason was touching on this album is just tremendously confusing because everything's at odds with one another. You know, at times you'll get a song with like those big classic Mutt Lang version, Def Lep backing vocals, like in Turn to Dust. But then it's all just like not gelling. The guitar, the vocals, percussion, the lyrics and production are all performing different 
like emotion levels and not communicating the same things and they're at odds with one another they don't they like none of it comes together to make a song like you have no idea what you're supposed to feel listening to any of these songs it's just all clutter deliver me is really lame all i want is like this raw stripped down drum sound out of nowhere it's very bland work it out has that classic like mid 90s sound that we hate and then you get the tremendous like fake friggin garage band drum intro on a couple songs Pearl of Euphoria might be the only song that's not terrible on here, but it's a bad album and I'm with you, but I don't think it's atrocious. Two stars, number 11, slam. Okay, uh, I'm not with you guys so far. I got Diamond Star Halos is my number 11. But it stinks. All these stink. It doesn't matter. I don't even care. Every time I listen to it, I was like, okay, this is the worst album. No, wait, this is the worst album. And I think Diamond Star Halos, uh, Take What You Want's okay. It's got those nice backing vocals. It's got a nice 80s riff, but then it falls apart even more. Even Alison Krauss on two songs can't save it at all. This guitar, just, okay, it's a nice stripped back, twangy little number, but so boring, anonymous. And um, I don't know, like they, they change things up a little bit, like Goodbye for Good this time no, goodbye for good this time i think what's called uh it's got some strings in there and some classical guitar and they're trying something new but it still sounds lame and it's just way too late in the game for them to try like something out of left field like that elliot sounds like bon jovi his vocals i think are a little bit better than on def leopard where he just i don't think he could hit anything so maybe they're producing him more or, i don't know he sounds slightly better but still not good lifeless another track with Alison Krauss just stinks completely lifeless and uh really bad lyrics he's I mean the band just gets worse and worse at writing lyrics and not that they were, were great but this album just did absolutely nothing for me so two stars all right next up for me is songs from the sparkle lounge from 2008 I was really hoping that the covers album would at least like serve a purpose the covers album yeah came right before this and i thought thought maybe it would like even though it's not an amazing covers record i thought it would at least maybe put them in touch with their you know their glam rock roots and and get some like inspiration from it but coming to this one it's just really dull really lifeless pretty big letdown lyrically like you guys were saying the, the later day records are just not good and this one might be the worst it feels very very empty you've got songs like go and come on come on Gives you very little except this vague feeling that a band that would like like you to pump your fist in the air or something. That's really all that is happening. There's even a song on this record called Cruise Control, which is very fitting. And again, they're trying to steal from Bon Jovi with that playbook and tapping into the country market and getting Tim McGraw to duet on a song. Um, I don't think that this record is quite the train wreck that X was, but it's boring, it's bland, and really disappointing. Two stars. Oh, man, I'm going to be the ugly duckling for uh, this whole episode. I don't think there are that many terrible Def Leppard albums. But call me just a sucker for fun. This band's fun. Number 10, Euphoria 2.5. We're already in decent territory here. There's only decent albums all the way up. Look at Joe's like, are you kidding me? Uh, but this is a bit of a lost album. It's from 1999, and it's kind of falling into like that collective soul and live grunge is over. We're no longer dark. We're sunny, and everything's got a golden sheen to it. I don't really know if they want to know what they wanted to do here. On Slang, they were like, yeah, we want to go dark and try to tap into that market and be modern with everyone else that's doing the really you know, grimy sort of sludgy rock sound. And then they're like, nope, that didn't work, so we might as well go back and try something else. It's a little bit pretty post grunge pop rock, but a ton of robust production, a little bit of 80s fury at times. You get a little bit of those classic Def Leppard touches, definitely one of their softer albums. And a lot of it almost has like that early 90s Van Halen production, like on For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge a little bit. Promises sounds like it's right from that album, but the catchiness doesn't stick here. You don't have the big, you know, most of these albums are just Def Leppard by numbers after they did Hysteria and pyromania you know if it wasn't them going way out of left field with something like slang or doing covers album they were like let's just stick with the coca-cola formula and the recipe let's do it 
and it never just matches how good they could be, but it's hard to dislike it that much because it is so similar to what's great about them. Paper Sun is probably the best on this album. Yeah, it's just got that sunny wind in her hair, late 90s kind of feel. So it's a little bit modern, but there's a, you know, at times a sharp turn back to the 80s pop metal days. None of the songs are nearly as bad as anything on Slang, but not nearly as good as anything on a Adrenalize or Pyromania or Hysteria or High and Dry. 21st Century Sha La 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 Girl has a pretty sick riff, and I kind of like that song. And I bet Jason does too. But also, like, yeah, it's just a lot of recycling, so you can't get that excited about it. I'm never going to revisit it. But I didn't hate it. So 2.5 for Euphoria, number 10. All right, Slang, um, number 10. This is a pretty lame attempt at, you know, 90s post-grunge alternative. Although, I mean, you kind of give them credit for trying something like this, but the execution just doesn't work. Uh, you got that, um, you know, Middle Eastern wailing and instrumentation uh, from the Sarangi and some like cashmere-esque orchestration on Turn to Dust. And I don't know, there was just something about the 90s. It was like, oh, let's explore the sounds of the Middle East and like all these records. And it never worked once. And I'm glad we've moved well past that. You got Slang, the song, which has a little bit of like a hip hop beat to it. And Elliot's doing like a quasi rap. And that, that kind of thing, like, you know, they did a little bit of it on like Pour Some Sugar on Me, so the short choppy vocals, but... Like, this is just really embarrassing, you know, attempt at like a Prince song or something. And it's just, it's too 90s. It sounds way too 90s, especially now. Uh, the tone, the singing, the style. It doesn't feel anything like a Def Leppard album. It, you know, it might as well not be. Breathe a Sigh is like vaguely R&B again. And they're, they're trying different stuff, but it's just, I don't know, they're not good songwriters for the most part, and they can't do other things. Like they, they know how to do two things and they do those things pretty well. And anytime they go outside of that comfort zone, it's pretty lousy. Pearl of Euphoria kind of has like an edge guitar sound, which is cool. Like that's a decent song and Move With Me Slowly. It sounds a little bit like the Black Crows, a little bluesy. That one's not bad, but it, it can't save this album. It's too long. It's too 90s. It's 2.5 stars. And that's it's a low 2.5 stars. It's probably my, I mean, all of these are in my bottom five for the years that they uh, come out so far. And that'll continue. All right. Next up for me is Euphoria. Unbelievably, after slang, they decide to work with the same producer. Uh, it makes no sense. And once you make a record like Slang, it's hard to get back on track. Like you can't do that again, obviously. You get tore apart in in the uh, reviews, but you also can't just like completely go back on it. Otherwise it looks like you're like just totally retreating. Euphoria kind of splits the difference, but it mostly returns to their classic sound. Promises the main riff of that track sounds exactly like some old Def Leppard song. I don't know exactly which one. A lot of those sound similar anyways, but I think it's Animal that they're kind of ripping off. Um, it's a decent song, but there's nothing really new about it. Back in Your Face is terrible. It's got like those Gary Glitter-esque haze that just sound really lame. All Night has some of the most um, embarrassing kind of like has-beens trying to be cool type of vibes that I've ever heard. It's like this unholy marriage of the worst of 80s and, and 90s production sounds. I think Cram is exactly right that Paper Sun is the one song on here that does a pretty good job of, you know, kind of marrying the 80s with the 90s. It's by far the best song here. But then they follow that with It's Only Love, which is awful. I don't know. This is the sound of, the, of a band that's just totally lost, I think. And occasionally here they stumble onto a decent song in the dark. But this is really a mixed bag of styles and quality. And in the end, it's just kind of meh. So two and a half stars. Promises sounds like the riff from Standing on Top of the World by Van Halen. And they do that all the time, which is fine. Number nine, I've got, yeah, 2.5. It's decent. Guess what? We covered a classic rock band that did a covers album later in their twilight of their career. And this one's actually not that bad. Um, 
to what Joe was talking about, the strength of this album is they didn't write any of the goddamn songs because they had, they're all covers and that's really helping them out. And, you know, we've talked a lot about this because we've covered, mm, what, 15 different artists who have done a late period covers album. It's hard to find what you want in a straight covers album. Like, do you want, do you want it to be a big departure from the original and made totally your own and, you know, the vein of the artist that you're covering? Or do you want to like keep it true? Or do you want to find some sort of middle ground? They go pretty much just, we're going to cover it straight up, but we still sound like Def Leppard. So you're going to hear Def Leppard. And a lot of these tracks kind of works. 20th Century Boy actually sounds pretty good. It sounds like just a good, you know, friggin' T-Rex cover band kind of. And I kind of think there's a charm to this album because... I don't think they were failing at this point as much as you guys probably do, but I think they kind of needed this. They're just like, let's just have some fun. These are tunes that we liked growing up. You know, you get the Bowie song in there. And if you kind of read the track listing, there are some interesting choices in there. And then you hear them cover it and it's like, no, this is exactly what I would think it would sound like Def Leppard doing this song. And they're just kind of having fun, which I like. They're getting just, you know, getting some of their feel back a little bit. And you can't even say like they're putting a Def Leppard twist on any of these songs. It's just straight up covers and they just make their instruments, the sonic textures they always do. It's just pretty normal. But, you know, you can listen to it straight through. I won't seek it out again, so I'm sticking under three stars, but I definitely didn't dislike it. And they're all covers, so that's a good start. All right. I'm going to go with X for my number nine. And it's not a good album, but it is, I don't know, different enough, I guess, that I didn't hate it. And I don't know, I'm just pretty tired of like them mining the hysteria pyromania riffs. They bring in some outside songwriters. So I think the songwriting is actually superior. It's very mid, but it's superior than what they're doing and what they could do on their own because. What they were doing was not working. It's a blatant Bon Jovi ripoff. Uh, when Bon Jovi kind of got back in the limelight with It's My Life. Four-letter word, reasonably catchy. Uh, kind of Bon Jovi meets Aerosmith in the 90s, which really isn't something to like aim for. Like if that's what you're setting your sights on. Torn to shreds. It sounds like a late 90s, early 2000s pop rock song. It's just very much going with the flow of what everyone else is doing. Uh, Gravity tries for like some R&B flavor and comes crashing down to earth. There's not really any great songs, probably not even any good songs, but just a collection of very average, extremely average songs. Um, so I'm I'm at 2.5 still for X and that might be too high. I don't, I don't even know. Who cares? It doesn't matter. You're supposed to care. Def Leppard really killed me. I gotta say, I was expecting a little bit better than this. I quite enjoyed it. They're, right. they're your three dog night. Fair enough. It's always an animal. All right. Next up for me is going to be Diamond Star Halos. And I thought eventually that they would stop trying to write hits and like just be themselves and rock out and jam or whatever. But they just seem absolutely hell bent on like trying to stay modern, trying for some sort of like commercial relevance. It just doesn't work. Once again, here you get a mix of generic, underwritten rock songs, lame ballads, a couple stabs at capturing the country market, since those are the only people that still buy records, with a couple duets from Alison Krauss. Just a bunch of really obvious grabs for relevance. Nothing on here is really, you know, quite as bad as their worst albums, but I was really hoping, you know, to close out this discography with like a, a bounce back or like some sort of like you know, punctuation on the end of this discography to like leave me with a good feeling. And I just did not get it with this at all. You know, I wanted them to finish it on a strong note. Instead, they kind of go out with a whimper. I guess it remains to be seen if they'll put out another record. I'm sure they probably will, but I have little to no expectation for whatever they do next. I really can't understand why this band is still just like thinks they can make it make hits. Just be a rock band. Like, I don't know. They seem really misguided. Two and a half stars. That album rules, and they did end on a good note if they're ending. I had it at 3.5 for a bit, but I took it down. 
it's not a really good album. So I, I came back down to earth a little bit there. But what are we on, number eight here? I think we're on number eight. And I'm talking about the debut, Only Through the Night. So there are later Def Leppard albums I like more than this debut. This one kind of put me to sleep a little bit. Two and a half stars. I think Rock Brigade is really cool. It's pretty raw, shoot from the hip kind of rock and roll. I had never heard this one, I don't think. And it's not really what I expected. They're like really trying to emulate like a little bit of just good old meat and potatoes kind of 70 rock, like a little bit of deep purple, a little bit of like thin Lizzie, I'd say. Um, you know, you don't have that pretty boy pop metal kind of shimmer and vibe. And I think that's the problem what I have with this is like, I hear Joe Elliott saying, and unless he's like doing his like cutesy, trying to be attractive kind of deal, I'm not really buying like the hard edge rock and roll here with him singing. Different guitar lineup, a little bit of like UFO vibes, just not as good. The metal's not really there. You get a little bit of British New Wave feel. You'll get it more coming up on the next album. It's not bad. It's just pretty run of the mill. There's some good power riffing like on Wasted. Rocks Off is okay. The overture at the end is pretty unnecessary. Other than like Rock Brigade, there's just nothing that really stands out. And it just kind of sounds like every decent rock album you've heard before. And that's what it is. It's a decent rock album. So 2.5 only through the night. Which I think is probably Jason's number one. Is it? I don't know. Is it? No, he likes Mutt too much for that. It'll it'll be maybe high and dry. Uh, number eight is going to be Songs from the Sparkle Lounge. Another 2.5, just really mid, really kind of sad attempt at rock. But uh, a couple more good choruses, a couple more big, meaty, hard rock hooks, I think, on this one than what they had done in the past 10 years and what they would do in the next 15, 14, whatever it was. Although having Tim McGraw on any track is just completely pointless, especially if it's like over this ACDC like riff. Um, and yet it still rocks harder than anything they've done in a while. So I don't know. Don't see the point of Tim though. Come on, come on. It's like mildly catchy. Bad actress has really crummy lyrics. Uh, chorus that you wish was bigger. But it has some slick guitar on there at least. And Come Undone has, you know, nice hard rock riffs and some backing vocals that are a little bit more interesting than the usual, like rugby group vocals, rugby chant group vocals, some interesting harmonies. It's kind of cool. Wish they did that a couple more times. And I think the production emphasizes the riffs, the guitars, you know, the bass, the drums, the vocals from Joe that are fine, a um, little more hooks, a little more guitars closer to their 80s stuff but like it's still sort of just like a, a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy at this point so even even the tracks that do have like a good edge and some catchy choruses are still like eh, I'll, I'll listen to pyromania thank you how in general do we feel about elliot as a vocalist though uh i think he's quite good in the 80s and early 90s I think Joe Elliott's voice is serviceable. Like, and I don't think he ever sounds bad, but I don't think there's a ton of character in his voice, at least compared to like his contemporaries. Um, I don't think he's you know, like that distinguishable. He's fairly anonymous sounding. Uh, next up for me is the self-titled record from 2015, Def Leppard. The record before this opened with a track called Go and closed with a song called Gotta Let It Go. And here they return with a track called Let's Go. Um, it's like, Come on, guys, can you write a song that means anything at all? It just absolutely empty lyrics. Even though the writing's not the best here, I think they do a better job of getting back to their classic sound than they have in ages. I think the production here is a lot better than it's been. I can't tell if the Pour Some Sugar riff is an intentional callback or not, or if they're just like ripping themselves off unintentionally, or if it's like, hey, remember when we did this song? Or I, I don't really get what they're going for there on the opening track on dangerous. They sound like themselves again, though, for like the first time in ever. I think it's the best song they've done in ages. It almost sounds like a classic Def Leppard song. Pretty good. 
And then sadly, after that, I think, you know, things start slipping back into uh, that lame Bon Jovi and or band boy band territory that they were dabbling with on previous records. Uh, we Belong completely sucks. Uh, energized, not very good and not much energy to be found. All Time High is a very lame rocker that uh, is a very lame rocker. Uh, they dabble with acoustics on a few tracks here that is kind of, I don't know, different at least. Um, so like I said, best production in a long time, but really only one good song. I think Dangerous is pretty cool. And the rest of the record is very, very forgettable. Uh, two and a half stars still. I think you saying, guys, can you write songs about anything at all? <laughs> it's one of the top 10 funniest things you've ever said on this channel. And you're right. Yeah. I mean, other than go, let's go, come on, let's go. You also got let's get rocked. Like, what are these songs about? They're just rally cries. But it's pretty badass. We're on number seven here. And I am going to make a bold statement and go up to three stars and say there are seven good Def Leppard albums. Am I the only one in the world that thinks that? Maybe Joe Elliott and Joe Elliott's mom, but that's about it. I don't care. I've got the self-titled 2015 Def Leppard here. Three stars. It's good. Is it more of the same? Yeah, but there's a big sweet-ass riff on Let's Go. There it is, Let's Go. And I really dig it. And I think this one kind of matches the sound the most of their old stuff more than any other album. I also really like Dangerous. There's a really cool little lick on it. The drums, though, are much more active on this album, I think. But Man Enough is got this kind of cool change in style and bass driven opening for them. Almost has like more old school classic rock Aerosmith type feel, like a little bit of slippery R&B. I think there's also a good little bit of variety on here. There's some ballads or some heavy stuff. There's some more melodic stuff. And I don't think they fall into the cliche path that much because they basically invented this version of cliche that they're doing. Maybe the solos leave a little bit up to the imagination, but you never really listen to Def Leppard for the solos. Invincible has the bright infectiousness to it. The sound is big, full, and enjoyable. I am a sucker for these kind of basic, big, grand rock albums if the hooks and the melodies and the vocals are good enough. Wait till we do Goo Goo Dolls and we talk about those post-90s albums that everyone kind of shits on, but you know, I kind of have a soft spot for. Battle of My Own is like a cool little groove. And sometimes I think their problem with getting into just like a lack of creative, like progressivism is they, they never change their instruments. Like there's almost never a song with just acoustic guitar or piano or anything really. Like Joe mentioned the one time they tried a little bit of a middle, middle Eastern thing and that's it. That's all we've talked about. Other than that, it's just big hair metal rock, you know, drums, bass, they never bring anything else outside of the closet and try to do anything. They are so comfortable in their comfort zone and I don't mind it. I'm giving in three stars and I'm giving more three stars. So get used to it, punks. Okay. We'll give it three star. I got a three star here for, yeah. <laughs> um, some of these are, are pretty good. The glam rock stuff. I think they do well. 20th century boy. Golden Age of Rock and Roll, even Drive-In Saturday is not bad. And there's some cool ideas, like this track list is insanely good. It might have the best track list of any cover album I've ever seen. It's just they don't execute well on everything. Uh, Hanging on the Telephone, no. Waterloo Sunset, no. Street Life, oof, no. That... Ugh. That's the worst cover on the whole album. Phenomenal song. Great song, but they just suck all the energy out of that bad boy. It is it is bad. So, I mean, there's some good, some bad. That's, you know, kind of averages out to three stars. I do love the cover of Don't Believe a Word, though, from Thin Lizzy. It's such a great song. And they do pretty good justice to it. So, um, good idea. Not great execution all the way through. So, three stars. Jason has not talked about that album yet. Could it be his number one? No, it is my number six. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't have a lot to add. This was probably a good time in their career to pause and do a covers record. 
normally when you're, you know, going through these discographies and you see the covers record, you're like, oh God. With Def Leppard, I saw it coming and I was like, oh, thank God. Finally, a little pause from whatever else this is, is going on with this band. It's okay. I mean, it's a good celebration of the glam that they love. Uh, I don't think they really do anything new or interesting with it, but but it's a good song selection. And I don't think, like Joe, I don't actually think any of it's bad. I mean, I think Street Life is what I would have expected. It, it, basically, everything on here is like, imagine Def Leppard doing this song, and that's exactly what it sounds like. But it's just good to hear them like relaxed and not second guessing every move they make. Not trying to make hits, not trying to be so calculated. It's fun. It's like the only time in their discography that they have any fun after Adrenalize. So yeah, it's fine. It's three stars. Yeah. Okay. I'm more enthusiastic about stuff. That's fine. We know there's one commentator that's going to be on my bandwagon here. Is that Gattaca who's always into Def Leppard? I don't remember. But whoever you are out there, you're welcome. My number six, I've got Sparkle Lounge. Three stars, a little bit of a country vibe, like you guys were talking about, cashing in on that Bon Jovi crossover, bit of a throwback to the simplicity of their writing, kind of back to basics, but doesn't have that 80s vibe. So they're going back to basics with their songwriting, their lousy songwriting, but not to the 80s production. But at the same time, you get a little tired of it. The riffs are big and enjoyable. Here's another one. Come on, come on. Like, what's that song about? It's just another song about nothing that's just got a rally cry to it. Just sounds like it came right out of the 80s. And so I'm kind of caught in between. Like, do I like the fact that they're just playing it so friggin' safe and just giving you what you want over and over and over until you get sick of it? Luckily, these albums come out like seven, eight years apart, so you can't really get sick of it. And I think I prefer it because, good Lord, we did see them try to experiment on slang and X, and it did not work. Um and I just don't think they have the talent in them to come up with anything too authentic. They didn't really find themselves until they had Mutt Lang. And when Mutt Lang left, they got nothing. They just hung on to what Mutt Lang gave them and just kind of tried to recycle it over and over. And I think they do a decent job of it. But let's not pretend like, you know, they're coming out like talking heads or anything. And they're the most artistic band in the world. Cruise Control is a big bust of a song. Getting into a little bit of overproduction territory there. But I think Elliot sounds good on this album. Def Lep by numbers, some good solo. Bad actress has a cool riff. It is what it is. They would be the best bar band in your small town with these albums. So, number six, Sparkle Horse, Sparkle Pug. What the hell is it called? Sparkle Lounge. <laughs> Sounds nothing like Sparkle Horse. Completely different band. My number six is going to be Euphoria, which. Uh... I thought it was okay. Uh, I love the cover with just six lens flares, just really dynamite there, really creative. Same guy who did the Phantom Menace posters, probably. <laughs> um, but I think some of these songs are pretty decent. Demolition Man, got some bluesy kick to it. Uh, run and gun vocals, which help disguise the terrible lyrics, which... Pretty much all, everything post uh, Pyromania, maybe? I, hysteria. Just really bad lyrics. I don't know who writes the lyrics, but they're frequently awful. Promises sounds like just a Hysteria or Pyromania ripoff. Exact same flavor, guitar style, same backing vocals. Just slightly worse, but it's a decent track. Uh, back in Your Face sucks, though. Just terrible. Goodbye, really weak power ballad. All night, semi embarrassing, uh, funky Prince ripoff. And Elliot's vocals, he's doing like this. I don't even want to say what he's doing, but it's, it's just gross. Um, paper, he's, he's like being way too like sexualized and like just. He's like orgasming into the microphone. Yeah, it's, he can't, he can't pull it off. Not in 1999. Or whenever this album came out, uh, but Paper Sun's pretty good. Got some interesting, like psychedelic y synths, um, some good backing vocals, a really catchy chorus, and could have used a couple more tracks like that. Twenty first century, sha la 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 girl, pretty catchy, but 
really bad lyrics and the vocals kind of get annoying. And in general, just too many like weak, big, soppy ballads. It's only love, goodbye, to be alive and guilty are all pretty weak. Uh, the instrumental disintegrates not bad. Uh, but the final two tracks are actually pretty darn good. Day After Day and Kings of Oblivion kind of harken back to that old school, new wave of British heavy metal, early 80s feel. And I, I could have used a whole album just like that. Something, you know, instead of trying to rip off Hysteria all the time, rip off High and Dry or, or On Through the Night a little bit. Uh, day After Day, the closer, great crunchy rocker, good propulsive beat. Has a really nice big ramp up into the chorus and those big mutt laying group vocals. So that one's a solid one too. So it ends on a good uh, high note, which maybe colors my overall impression of the album, but I'm still at three stars, so who cares? And unlike our merchandise, three stars does not mean good for Joe. No, three stars is, I uh, won't even think about it again, ever. Just not even, 3.5 stars, I'll think about it. I'm not going to listen to it, but three stars. I ain't even going to think about it. Ten, it doesn't exist. And that means no, because you're a dad. And when dads say, I'll think about it, it's it's going to be a no. All right, next up for me is Adrenalize. This is kind of a weird record because it came out in 92. I don't think I've ever heard a single song from it, but it had a bunch of singles. It sold 7 million copies. It seems like, I don't know, like history has erased this record uh, or something. Like no one remembers this uh, talking to some other people. Like it, it seems like it didn't exist. But I mean, how do you even begin to follow up a juggernaut like Hysteria? And now you've got grunge happening. Steve Clark died in 1991. Mutt Lang left. He's working with Brian Adams now. So I don't know. It's it's kind of weird. It's It's not a bad record. The production does a pretty good job of approximating what Mutt Lang would do but it, it doesn't quite have the same like sparkle or energy to it there are some catchy songs heaven is especially I think is a pretty good tune however there's like a one dimensionality to this record that is I don't know it's almost like unsettling not that they were doing anything like deep or arty before but it felt really well crafted it felt like they were putting a lot of effort into making the record sound really good. And this feels more like a Xerox copy of something that was well-crafted. Um, it doesn't quite have the same energy to it. Um, Heaven Is, Tonight, Stand Up, I think, you know, not bad, but something just a little bit missing. Have You Ever Wanted Someone So Bad, I think is a good ballad as well. I Want to Touch You, pretty catchy, but I don't know. There's just something missing. It's like almost... It almost sounds exactly like the previous records, but it's just not quite as good. Three stars for me. Number five for me, three stars still. I've got Diamond Star Halos. A lot of good songs on here. I love the opening part to Take What You Want, and then it gets a bit lame. This one's from 2022. Joe Elliott obviously doesn't have the same chops that he used to, but it's not terrible. He stays in his wheelhouse, stays in his lane the way he should. It's a pretty messy mix. This is probably the worst put together engineered album that they've got. And that kind of really hurts because when I think of Def Leppard, I don't think of ugly sounds whatsoever. You think of that really sheen, glimmery, Mutt Lang production. I like the song Kick a lot. It has big old school Def Leppard vibes and it's pretty enjoyable. And you got to love those kind of guilty pleasure songs. This is what they're good at. Fire it up. Kind of similar. Man, I didn't even think about this taking my notes, but Jason is so right. We should just collect all of the song titles and songs that mean absolutely nothing. It's just like, come on, let's go. Yeah, here we go. Fire it up. Kick, kick start. Let's go. Like, it's just all. They just want to be every in every soccer and baseball and football stadium in the world with these songs. The big stadium backing vocals do bring it together like normal. Uh, this guitar, that song is re really bad. It's way too bad Bon Jovi, but Liquid Dust has some cool shimmeriness. So you're kind of seeing here that a lot of these songs are hit and miss for me. But as a whole album, I kind of have fun with this album quite a bit. Uh, Rock Me is pretty cool, even though they're spelling me, M-I-I. -I. also want to point out that sometimes they spell the word U, Y-O-U, and sometimes they just use a capital U. Who's making these really important decisions? 
I don't know. It wasn't on the Wikipedia page, but we should look into that. All we need is a really joyous tune. I like it. There's just like an unabashed, cheap, good, easy fun here. Like you can get day drunk and lay on the beach and listen to this album and have a pretty damn good time. It's not what I did, but you could. Full of sunny, positive vibes. Angels is a good little ballad at the end. Kind of dies off at the end, much weaker stuff. But, you know, by the time you get there, you're just kind of enveloped in their sheer goodness. It's just a big, big ball of fun. Not as much fun as their other stuff. You guys disagree because you don't know how to have fun anymore. So three stars for you guy, you cranky ass guys over here. I like it. It's my top five. Listen, I know how to fun, have fun. Like I'm the fun guy. I like the fun music. I fun, fun. I fun. I fun. Um, my number five is going to be Adrenalize. And this is the Force Awakens of music, if you will. It is such a carbon copy of like a good thing that when you're listening to it for the first time, like you're like, okay, this is pretty good. Like I like these songs, these sound good. And like the moment you start thinking about it, it just completely falls apart as just an utter ripoff and like boring kind of carbon copy but you still kind of like it because it has like really great special effects and like it's it's a classic so you know something like let's get raw is just such a bad song but it's so unbelievably engineered to be catchy it's like 12 script doctors like had a, a hand and like okay let's put in this part with the, the violins because that's really clever and, and cute and like it, it kind of works because it is a really catchy song and it's lodged in my brain. Have you ever needed someone so bad it is incredibly catchy. It, I don't think it's a good song, but it's just like in your brain and it won't leave. And it's just all copies. It's all ripoffs of stuff they'd already done that was much better before. And they brought in, you know, J.J. Abrams to do a little script, a little little polishing on it and turn it into something that sounds good so i get it like it's a bad album but it's super catchy so it's three stars and my number five it's like a jerry bruckheimer production of a song pretty much pretty much but i i think i like jerry bruckheimer more like he has his own style like this doesn't have its own anything it's just something else that came before it you know in a lesser version number four for me, is On Through the Night, the debut from 1980. I don't know. This is the only uh, Def Leppard record, I think, that gives off any kind of connection to the new wave of British heavy metal, which is really kind of where they started. But they lose that pretty quickly and become a much uh, kind of poppier hard rock. Uh, this one, you can hear little bits of like Maiden or Priest in their sound, but you also get like older hard rock as well, like UFO and Thin Lizzy. And even though it's not as polished and as well produced as they would become, they already have these very tight uh, harmony vocals. You can hear it plain as day on the intro of Hello America. Maybe a little bit of Queen influence in there as well. I think it's a pretty cool record in their discography, simply for the fact that it's easily the most hard rocking. And I'm sure for a lot of Def Leppard fans, a certain sect of them at least, that that's all it really takes to be their favorite Def Leppard record. However, I think it is flawed, and I think you can see pretty clearly why they evolved away from this. I don't think it quite plays to their strengths. I think the production is a little thin, and I think as players, they have a bluesier feel than a lot of the other um, new wave of British heavy metal bands. And, you know, for speed and ferocity, you know, they'd never be able to keep up or compete with the other, like, premier acts in that genre so I think it was wise of them to move away from being like a speedy, uh, fast metal band. I think in trying to be heavier here, the writing sort of becomes a little generic. Um, none of the riffage here really stands out as being very catchy or memorable. Um, Sorrow is a Woman, I think is a pretty sweet track, though, with some bluesy lead work, some good uh, twin guitar attack there from Willis and Clark. Satellite, I think, is... Uh, already starting to sound a little like classic Def Leppard with the ooh yeahs in the chorus. It Don't Matter, I think, is a decent hard rock tune. Get a little bit of a Calling Dr. Love feel on that one. A lot of the record, though, especially when the walls came tumbling down, just feels like B-rate Maiden. 
Um, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world to be. And it's kind of a cool record, but I think they just, you know, aren't quite aware yet of exactly what their wheelhouse is. Um, so like Cram said, it's a decent record. It's pretty cool for, for the fact that it is a bit more hard rocking. It's just, you know, not the best of that genre. So three stars. All right. My number four, I've got high and dry. It was close between this and Adrenalize, which is going to be my number three. Hello, Mutt Lang comes in packing way more punch. The sound is already so much better. You get like the twin guitar attacks on bringing on the heartbreak and stuff like that. You get the one, two punch at the beginning with let's go and another hit and run title track school. I don't have that pretty boy girliness yet. Still trying to be a bit tough, which I'm still not totally buying, which is why I only have it three stars, but you're getting more of that mutt lang vocal production, which is huge, but he doesn't really know who they are yet and they'll figure it out. So it almost kind of sounds like he's doing his ACDC kind of approach to them here. And it's definitely an improvement, I think. Bring on the heartbreak rules. First half of this album is much better. Second half doesn't veer off completely. I don't mind. You got me running, uh, kicking off the second half. Definitely some cool stuff on the second half. But, uh, you know, it'd probably be 3.5 for the second half matched. So it's kind of a case of a halves for me. But I really like it. And, uh, yeah, three stars for high and dry. Really like a three star album, huh? I don't buy it. Um, it's my number four, and I have it at four stars. However, I think it's quite good. We're into the glory days, the eighties, and it's just such a big difference. Like everything outside of the eighties, just I never ever want to think about again. But um, here in the eighties, you know, you got Mutt Lang coming in polishes everything up you got the really great backing vocals all over the place the vocals themselves sound much better and it's you know it's an obvious muttling production like it would be hard to not know that he had his fingers all over this on let it go you, you kind of have all the traces of new wave of british heavy metal liquidated like they're, they're pretty much pushed out the same formula on vocals that they'll reuse on pyromania and hysteria the, the group vocals and, and elliot's you know, he's got a little bit of like a Brian Johnson, like grit and grime to his vocals, which are nice. I think the guitar, like heroics, the riffs, the solos are tuned down a little bit, not quite as as gnarly or advanced. Um, so, he, you know, Lane comes in, tells them probably to focus more on the, the big riffs and less on the, the solos and the little, you know, figures and new wave of British heavy metal Judas Priest stuff. So they're, they're closer to like ACDC, especially on something like High and Dry Saturday Night. Bringing on the Heartbreak is really like the template that they'll take into Pyromania for those big, like heavy ballads. And it sounds great. You know, the guitars, fantastic tones, lots of fuzz, but still like brushing with pop music. You've got the catchy choruses, you know, you want to sing along. And that's really where they're going to make their money in the next couple of years. But, you know, they, they do throw in like an instrumental with Switch 625. I think Lady Strange has a little bit of like the um, Dio Black Sabbath feel to it. Uh, Mirror Mirror has like a little fantasized version of that harder edged rock that they'll really go to on Pyromania. No, no, no. You know, it's pretty much ACDC. Um, but, you know, it's all good sounding it's a good template and they're just really good at what they do and they really show it on high and dry and they'll get better at it. But um, I think on this album, they, they come into what makes Def Leppard Def Leppard. So good four star album for them. All right. Top three. Now I'm going to go with high and dry as well. I think hooking up with Mutt Lang was just huge for this band. Um, like I said, in the previous review, I don't think they really knew their strengths before and Mutt seems to have immediately come in and pinpointed exactly what they are. The production on this record, not quite as over the top here as it would become on the next two records, which is good. I think, um, you know, the band feels very lively. The guitars are very forward, a huge improvement in vocal production, you know, starting to get the big gang vocals in the choruses, but I think even Joe Elliott's lead vocals sound way better here, more detailed, more character than, than they did on the debut record where they sounded pretty thin. 
I do really like the Willis and Clark guitar combo too. You know, maybe not as tech technical as uh, Campbell and Colin later on, but I think they've got a bit of a grittier, bluesier feel, which I like. I don't think they sound like they're trying to be Iron Maiden or Judas Priest at all anymore. It's very streamlined, kind of good, uh, you know, party rock, but still ha- with a toughness to it. Uh, Bringing on the Heartbreak is a great ballad, awesome atmosphere. Like Joe said, set a template for not only what they would do on Pyromania, but, you know, what a gazillion bands would do with their power ballads in the 80s. Uh, you Got Me Running, I think, is great. It almost sounds like a power pop song, but In Disguise is a hard rock song. Lady Strange, I think, has more of those great twin guitar leads, um, perhaps a nod to T-Rex's Baby Strange. Uh, the record, I think, is a great middle ground between the hard rock and pop elements of their later records. You know, as far as sound goes, this might be, you know, the kind of a sweet spot if you're looking for a bit more of that more rock guitar oriented sound but i think their songwriting still improves a lot after this on the on the subsequent records and you know the production does change it gets a lot glossier and then you know it's a matter of taste whether or not you prefer that but i really like uh mutt so i'm into the next two records a little bit more than this one three and a half stars yeah i could see like 10 percent of the death lap mega fans like gravitating to this before pyromania and hysteria adrenalize is my number three so i think we're all gonna have the same top two i would hope adrenalize i really like what joe had to say like just more great smiley pop metal it sounds like pyromania and hysteria went through just the scientific method and then just poured out into this album and that's kind of the problem with it is you can it's kind of a little too obvious at times they do their best to mimic Mutt Lang. Do a pretty good job, but probably less rocking at times than even Hysteria. There's a lot of bright pops in the album. Lots of glimmer and glam and huge sounding drums. A little more electronic sounds uh, throughout, though. Pretty good songs. I think it's an underrated album. It's not their absolute best. Uh, pretty big steep drop off from their best. Tonight is cool. Love the good 80s sounding metal arpeggio. I like the big winding guitar sound on White Lightning. Stand Up is kind of like the uglier stepsister to Hysteria. Let's Get Rocked is just pour some sugar on me and light. But it's still hooky. It's just everything is Pyromania and Hysteria, just not quite as much. Personal Property is really the only dud to me on the album. Have You Ever Needed Someone So Bad is a little too sappy, but it is kind of like still pretty sweet and enjoyable. It's right in between like Bon Jovi and Brian Adams, and it's a little dry. Yeah. I want to touch you. I don't mind. I like it a lot. I'm going 3.5 for a generalize. I think it's very good. It's ridiculous, but it's good. All right. Yes, we will have the same top two. Don't be ridiculous. Suggesting otherwise. My number three is going to be on through the night. I thought this is a pretty interesting uh, sounding album. I, I mean, I, I love what Mutt Lang does with Pyromania and Hysteria, but I also kind of like this direction. And I mean, 1980, this was pretty much the same time as as Iron Maiden. So I don't know if they were like ripping them off. It was was born from the same scene, the new wave of British heavy metal. Um, And I think there's an interesting combination of some ACDC on here, plenty of UFO I hear a lot of, and you know, the little Black Sabbath, stuff like that. Mind Dry kind of sounds like a, a prelude to better stuff, and this sounds like its own thing, which I appreciated in their catalog. Uh, so I was a woman, very Dio Sabbath sounding, which this might have been even before Dio joined Black Sabbath. I don't know. The, the timeline's a little odd because they recorded it in 79, uh, late 79s it came out in 80 so it, it was kind of all at the same time so i'm not going to say that they were ripping anyone off it could be you definitely um reminds me a little bit of judas priest especially elliot's vocals on that one uh, it gets real high and a little screechy uh, but interesting not as polished but uh, i think it has a lot of character satellite uh, a little more dynamic has a cool acoustic guitar bridge in there some ripping solos at the end I think Willis 
and um, Clark do a pretty darn good job with the leads on this, the little guitar figures and riffs and everything. When the Walls Came Tumbling Down, very theatrical, definitely indebted to Priest, but this was before, you know, Number of the Beast. So that spoken word kind of intro, that's it's a little new. It's cutting edge, I would say. It don't matter an answer to the master. Have some nice riffage, some galloping bass lines. You know, it's not that good time party rock. It's, you know, heavy metal. And I think they pull it off pretty well. Uh, even an overture with its multiple parts, a lot of Tony Iommi indebted riffs, some UFO, but, uh, some, you know, some good galloping bass lines, little fancy inspired lyrics. It's different from what they did afterwards, which was sort of all in the same, you know, general theme heartbreak and partying and banging chicks and stuff and and this is different it's new it's a little more uh, fantastical um and it's it's doesn't have the the mutt laying edge the production so i think it's it's an interesting cool pre you know famous sound and i think they could have done it pretty well maybe not you know iron maiden or, or you know, priest level but i think they could have done this and been successful in it they didn't, but I think this stands out in their catalog because of it. All right, my number two, the trifecta is still in play, but I can't imagine that we're not split on these top two. Uh, my number two is Pyromania. Um, you know, Mutt's production had always been like these tough streamlined rock mixes, back in black and, and stuff like that. And then as you start to get more into the, early to mid 80s you know he starts to get you know a little more uh i don't know flowery in his production a lot more layered vocals and stuff like that bigger reverbs and i really dig that i, I think the sound of his records in this era is just incredible i love the way these records sound just a big massive pop rock sound big gated drums uh, the vocals layered in, into infinity. Um, and, and I think the way he uses it to emphasize parts and, and like kind of push and pull the songs just to me, it's like perfect record making. He's not like just making them sound huge and nothing else. I think there's a real consideration in, in his production for the songs. And I think that's what makes it stand out above so many other producers of the era. It also feels like the band is kind of giving into their pop urges here a little too. They kind of let the melody take over more and everything else is in service to that. Whereas on High and Dry, there seemed to be an emphasis on, on like still trying to really rock, uh, which nothing wrong with that. But I, I think here everything is kind of working together, the, the songwriting and the performances and the production. Um, you know, I, I think probably having a couple hits on High and Dry and, and, you know, seeing how much a song like Bring It On The Heartbreak, you know, really changed their lives, probably, and how much fun it was probably probably to play live. You kind of get addicted to that. And, I, and I'm sure that they wanted to, you know, keep that going and have more hits. Um, and they had a bunch on this record, Photograph, Too Late For Love, Full In, I think are all killer pop songs. Um, I'm not as crazy about Rock of Ages. I think it has a really, really good chorus, but that very open verse with just the drum and vocals, I think is a little bit weak and I'm not crazy about it. But I think there's also some really good album cuts on this record. Stage Fright's really cool. Coming Under Fire is great. Billy's Got a Gun, I think is also very cool. Um, you know, if I was scoring just the production alone, I think it's an easy five. I think there's some great songs here. I think this is the beginning of their songs becoming almost indistinguishable though maybe the this the production is too similar on some of the tracks too many big choruses a lot of times you have to like wait until the chorus hits to know exactly what song you're listening to some of the guitar riffs aren't that unique so i think it's a good record i love the production i think there are some really great songs but i also think a lot of the songs sound the the same and by the end of it they're kind of a blur um, so I think it's a good record. Three and a half stars for Pyromania. So we got Hysteria and Pyromania. Left. I am keeping the trifecta intact. I've got Pyromania number two. 
disagree with a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of Jason with a lot, a lot. Disagree with a lot of what Jason had to say. I think the songs are all pretty different. Photograph, Too Late for Love, Foolin' starts off with like that ghostly acoustic thing. I do agree with Rock of Ages. It's got the um, I Got My Mind Set On You problem where the chorus rules and the verse sucks. And we should do an entire episode about that. And unfortunately, some of the non-hits are kind of duds, like Die Hard the Hunter. Action, not words. Not as good. But the hits are really good, and I think all of the other, you know, um, deep cuts that I didn't mention are pretty good. I don't mind Stage Fright, kind of like Coming Under Fire. Rock, Rock Till You Drop is awesome. Classic song about nothing, just a hype-up song. And I do think that, yeah, they obviously went far more commercial here, far more radio hits. And I think this is what Mutt Lang does best is he comes in and he finds what works and amplifies it and just gets tunnel vision on the few things that makes a band great and doubles down on it. Like you said, comes in, does high and dry. Not really sure what he's got with Def Leppard, but man, bringing on the heartbreak really worked there. And it kind of just stemmed what worked about it, put it all over this album. Songs are much better. Photograph's just a great song. You know, Too Late for Love is awesome. Just a lot of really good songs. Production is great. We can go on and on about the production. We'll talk about production on Thursday of Side 3. It's one of those albums where I have trouble finding what I don't like about it, but I'm only going 4.5. I think it's really great, but not a five-star album. Pyromania. Number two, Joe, what's it going to be? Uh, you guys are f- 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 fooling if you think I'm putting Pyromania at number two. My number two is Hysteria. And it's a great album, fantastic album all the way through. It is just like the formula that they established, just amped up to like biblical proportions, uh, kicking off with women, which speaking of biblical, God gave you women, lots of pretty women. Yeah, that's, that's such a beautiful line. Um, and that's what this album is just all about. It's just all the things that they do. You know, Animal is just photographed on steroids. Love Bites is just uh, bringing on the heartbreak on steroids. Like It's just everything that, you know, people like Jason gravitate towards with the production and the, the bigness and the, the fullness of the choruses and the great uh, vocal layering and everything. Like it's, it's perfect in all those manners. Uh, but I think it's a little too shiny at, at spots. It's a little too overproduced at spots. Um, and not that it makes a, a bad record or anything. It's just, I like sort of the, the grittiness of Pyromania a little bit more. I do think the vocals from Elliot are fantastic on this album. Um, every chorus, though, seems to be like one of those, Elliot says one thing and then group vocals with like five words and then Elliot's popping in every once in a while. And I do think it kind of makes it a little more anonymous sounding. It's not quite as, as Def Leppardy, maybe a little more Mutt Langy than Def Leppardy at this point. Um, and that's probably, you know, the best thing about it is, is Mutt Lang's production and, and the choruses. Um, everything's super catchy. Uh, Rocket is a really cool song it goes through all you know name drop and all the, the classic bands that they looked up to uh, it's got that interesting bridge that like spacey the weird kind of cutting in and out of different sounds which is cool animals obviously great love bites classic power ballad pour some sugar on me uh we probably are all sick of it but you can't argue that it's like a perfect song just the way it's constructed the way it makes you sing along to it um and you know armageddon's great too that first first side is just insane but side two i think gods of war and don't shoot shotgun run riot hysteria excitable love and affection are all very good well-constructed super catchy songs um and, uh, you know, it's 62 minutes. It's a, over an hour of sort of the same thing. Really glossy. Not too much variety. Enough. Um, but it's just a really good album. 
but it sometimes leaves me a little cold as far as like personality um so i have it at four and a half stars it didn't make my top five in 87 and it's just missing a little bit of that grit and uh you know uniqueness but it's you know you can't say it's not a just incredibly catchy well produced want to sing along to every song kind of album so yeah it's a classic of the of the 80s for sure all right that is my winner hysteria from 1987 as we've talked about in the past, 87, probably one of the most unique sounding years in history for whatever reason. So many things sounded very similar, had very similar production, really big sounding year. This record, no different. I think, you know, Mutt Lang had a string of records throughout the 80s where he just like kept one upping himself and making them bigger and bigger and shinier and this is probably like the peak of that. I don't think there was anywhere to go after this. Uh, this is about as big and glossy as you can make a rock record. Quite a bit of uh, turmoil to get to it. Uh, initially, uh, Mutt Lang wanted to take a little bit of a step back and take a break. He ended up doing Heartbeat City after Pyromania. Um, Rick Allen lost his arm in a car wreck. They had Jim Steinman trying to produce this record, and that didn't work out at all. Um, so eventually they ended up bringing Mutt back in. I can see why this record divides people. You know, I think it, it's made to be kind of like the hard rock thriller. They said they wanted a record where every single song could potentially be a, a hit single. And I think that definitely brings a, a level of cheesiness to it, being that this came out in 87. But that's kind of what was in style then. But it sounds great. It's an incredible sounding record. You can really crank it. it sounds very good loud. Mutt Lang spent three months mixing it. Uh, so everything is dialed into perfection. Tons of great songs. The hits, of course, are all uh, really great, with the exception of Pour Some Sugar On Me. Rocket, Animal, Love Bites, I think are all incredible pop songs. Pour Some Sugar On Me, I think, is a really terrible piece of writing, but it is infectious. It is hooky. Armageddon It, I think, has a great chorus, but again, I don't really love the verse on that one. Pretty dumb lyrics, too. Are you getting it? Armageddon It. Whatever. I think that overall, the record's a little too long, and listening to this type of sound for over an hour is a bit taxing. A little bit like too much of a good thing. But again, I don't really know what songs I would cut. I mean, pour some sugar on me, but you're obviously not going to cut a huge single like that. So I guess it's got to stay. Um, you know, tons of hits. Falls a little short of their Thriller goal. They had seven hit singles from it instead of the 12 that were on the record. Um, but I do think they chose the best songs to be singles. I think those are all obvious singles, even the ones that I'm not as crazy about. The only one that I think probably could have been a big hit that wasn't a single is Love and, a Love and Affection, kind of buried near the end of the record. But I think that is uh, equal to all of those other hits. Amazing sounding. I love the way it sounds. I could listen to it, you know, all the time. But I won't because I don't like Def Leppard that much. <laughs> uh a four-star record, Hysteria. So for so long, I didn't know if I liked Pyromania or Hysteria more. And pretty much over the last six to eight months, I've decided that it's Hysteria and I bumped it up to five stars. That first half is a six-star album. And then the second one, pretty much the reason, the thing that elevated it for me was Love and Affection and Don't Shoot Shotgun, which I think are pretty underrated tracks, especially um, Don't Shoot Shotgun. There's a live version of it. I think it's on Mirror Ball or whatever it's called. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, you guys already said it. The production is the star of the show here, but everything is tailored to help the production, like bring out the most, like has their best songs. The riffs are great. Joe Elliott and the backing vocals are just tremendous. It's just great pop metal. Like every song is so infectious and memorable and is an earworm. And it helps so much that they're just loud, aggressively shiny, pretty songs. So, you know, it's not like they get stuck in your head and you're just whistling it. Like they swarm around your head. They live in your head. They envelop your head. 
Hysteria is awesome. I just think the shine on this is perfect. Like where can Mutt Lang go from here? Yeah, you said it. Like if you, you're going to lose your teeth if the production gets any sweeter than this. It's just incredible. It's ear candy the same way Heartbeat City is and all the other Mutt Lang stuff. We'll talk about it Thursday. We'll talk about it Thursday. And it's just awesome. I love the only thing that I find weird is I just, I, I mean, I know Pour Some Sugar On Me doesn't open the album, but I just always assume that it does when I'm about to put it on because it just probably should. Like, it just seems like such an opener, but it doesn't. And it's fine. Women is a cool opener. Rocket Rules. They're all awesome. I don't know what else to say. But number one, five stars. All righty. I'll close things out with a little Pyromania and yeah hysteria is fantastic but i just feel like pyromania has a little more personality to it and you know i think photographs better than anything on hysteria i love rock of ages i love foolin i love too late for love i love stage fright it's got the mutt lang production but with a little harder edge uh, you know louder guitars the riffs are a little gnarlier it's not it's not quite as shiny and that's kind of what I lose with Hysteria. A little bit of that, you know, hard edge, big rock, uh, heavy metal that Pyromania has, um, especially on something like Stage Fright, which, I mean, it's pretty close to ACDC. Uh, Elliot's vocals definitely have that Brian Johnson-ified, you know, harshness, grit to them. But it still has, like, super great chorus, and it has probably Phil Collins' best guitar solo in there which you don't get on Hysteria much. Like those guitar solos are pretty much gone or tuned down to the point where it's just kind of generic a little bit. And this one still has like that touch, that hint of Judas Priest and new wave of British heavy metal. You know, it's, it's party priest. It's, it's got the best of both worlds. And I, I love Photograph. I think it's one of the best songs of the 80s, just untouchable 80s mainstream metal. Uh, there's little touches like the synth part and the pre-chorus that adds so much to it and then that chorus itself just phenomenal the call and response and everything is so great uh foolin's little harder rocking and i really love the verse there's a really cool guitar riff going up in the pre-chorus which is great got those great group vocals which the polish up a little bit for hysteria but you still have that effect and you still want to sing along, you know, every friggin' chorus is like a fist pumper, like, yes, I'm going to sing this with you. And Rock of Age is sort of the precursor to pour some sugar on me, that cowbell, slinky little guitar phrases. But um, I think it's great. I love the, the verses. I don't know what the hell you guys are talking about. The call and response is fantastic on that. And um I don't know. It's a great album. It was my runner up for 1983. Tons of personality, but with enough shininess and those huge, just mega oversized choruses that uh, I have it at five stars. So, yeah, I think it's a fantastic album from 1983. Pyromania, number one. All right. So there we go. Final thoughts on Def Leppard, guys. Cram seemed to say he enjoyed it a lot and then gave a whole lot of mediocre reviews. What? I was at three stars. I was giving good reviews by number seven. Come on. Yeah, but the words you said weren't that enthusiastic. Yeah, they were. Listen, Def Leppard is the, you know, I have the most hard rock cred, I think, amongst us. Def Leppard kind of sucks, I'll be honest with you. Outside of the 80s, total trash. I was expecting at least a little bit better, like something. Like a lot of the uh, bands that we do have like at least one or two like hidden gem albums where they like get back to bases and like just rock out a little bit. And this band just did not deliver anything past Hysteria. And, you know, it, it, they had a lot of tragedies in the band and things didn't go quite the way uh, they were supposed to. Didn't get Adrenalize out until, you know, five years after Hysteria. So I think that kind of killed any momentum they had and any growth they would have, you know, undergone. So 10 years, that's pretty much all you get in the rock biz to be great. And they only got four albums out in the 10 years. So I think that's kind of where it went wrong for them. But the 80s, they were great. Everything else sucks. Man, I take so much offense to the, you know, the most hard rock 
street cred. Come on, dude. No way. It's the guy that prefers Sammy Hagar to David Lee Roth and didn't really get into T-Rex or Thin Lizzy or anything. Come on, dude. Dude, come on. Also, like, this is interesting because, you know, like, they have two amazing albums. So are they still, like, one of the all-time great bands for having two of the best albums ever in their genre? Even though you guys and many other consider everything else to be pretty crappy. Like, if they only had Pyromania and Hysteria and High and Dry and Adrenalize, would we be like, man, they were awesome. I wish they made more records. Yeah, I would. But unfortunately... <laughs> Dumb question. Yeah, they kept going and that was bad. I don't, I don't even think that those... I'm topping out at four stars and that's because of the production. I think they were mostly just a vessel for Mutt Lang. He found a band that he could just kind of do his magic on that weren't going to push back against anything he wanted to do. They were kind of like a blank slate for him. Without him, they were basically nothing. Uh, so, yeah, I think without the production of Mutt Lang, even Hysteria and Pyromania are probably three and a half star records at best. So, yeah, not that great. And I thought at least something after the, the golden era would be decent, but man, it was all mostly pretty bad. So, wow. not the best week. Hey. Come on, Jason. They're not that bad. Is this like a worst five discography for you? I don't know. Maybe it could it could be bottom ten, perhaps. And to say that they're the best of the genre, I don't think that's even close. There's tons of hard rock and hair metal and all kinds of rock music in the eighties that's better than than these records. What what hair metal do you prefer to Pyromania and Hysteria? take uh long cold winter by cinderella i would take the first kingdom come record i would take uh some great white uh there's probably i don't know yeah there's a bunch okay all right everybody so let us know what you think of Def leopard are we being too hard on them am i being too hard on them uh, make sure you hit the like button subscribe to the channel Drop your list in the comments. Let us know what you think of our lists. And of course, check the video description for links to our website, Patreon, merch, all of that sort of stuff if you'd like to support the channel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.